Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this opportunity. We thank you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy. Father, we thank you for your spirit that leads us and guides us and gives us everything that we need. Father, you've been more than gracious to us. You've given us more than we could have ever expected or asked for or deserved, God. And so we thank you and we praise your name. Continue to do what only you can do, Father. Help me to deliver this word. Holy Spirit, preach, because you are way better at it than me. And I pray for the participants, Father, those who are here to receive. Open up their hearts, Father. Allow us to do what you want us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 One of the things that as we prepare for, you know, to be thankful, one of the things that God highlighted to me this morning um, to lift up was um, friendships. How many of us have friends? And so that's not something that everybody can say. And so just considering in your heart the importance of friendships, because even sometimes you don't have family, but you'll have a friend who will be there. It's a friend sometimes you can tell your secrets and you can, you know, your long nights with, you can stay with. And so being thankful for friendships, friendships, everybody needs a friend. The Bible says that um, uh, faithful are the wounds of a friend. And so even when you want to go the, the wrong direction, your friend will be there to help you get back on the right direction. We need to be more thankful and grateful and, and show our friends that we appreciate them. They don't have to be our friends. Sometimes we get in the mindset, oh, they got to be my. Don't think that. They don't. They can leave you. But we need to appreciate our friends. Amen. I know some, we talk about family, but friends are very important. Everybody needs a friend. Amen. Amen. All right. So there is a lot to talk about today. Um, I'm going to continue plowing um, in worship. Um, last week, just a quick recap, um, we, we learned about the, the title was Understanding Worship, Understanding Worship, and we learned that worship has to do with an attitude and acts. An attitude is the settled way of thinking and acts that come from that settled way of thinking. We also learned that worship, that word means as a dog would kiss his master. We learned that. We, we, we came up with the definition um, to pay homage um, and be of service to, due to having a reverence for worship. We learned that that to truly worship God, you have to do it through spirit and truth. You cannot do it outside of that. To truly worship God, you have to do it through spirit and truth. And we also learned that truth comes into your life to cleanse you, to, to, to change you, to renew your mind to wash you from idols and it comes into your life to set you free and introduce you to him we learned that the spirit of God empowers us to be of service to God you cannot serve God unless he is empowering you I can do all things through who Christ who strengthens me that has to do with the Holy Spirit the book of Acts was about a whole bunch of people who God worked through in order to do what he wanted to do the fruits of the spirit is by his spirit so you can be like him so we need the spirit in order to be of service unto him. We also learned that God disciplines those who he loves, um, those who are his children. And so God will take you through processes and circumstances in order to get you to know what you need to know, to grow you. Because um, you cannot be a worshiper without discipline. You cannot be a worshiper without God teaching you and showing you who he is. And so God will come into your life to humble you that you might learn something so that you may know something about him. And we learned that um, as this happens in my life, it's our job to stay steadfast in regards to what he showed us. Our heart has to remain steadfast, which means firmly fixed in regards to what God has revealed to me. Because the dangerous part is your heart will want to go astray, like a wild dog that's roamed away from its home. Your heart will try to go astray if you don't practice what? Remembering. We learned about the power of practicing remembering. I have to consistently and intentionally make myself remember what God has showed me, what he has said to me, who he is. If I don't practice remember, you may forget. And if you forget, your heart will go astray and you will serve other gods and worship other gods. If you don't practice remembering, then what happens is our heart, this should all be 
recap for those who were here, our heart will begin to test God. We will begin to question God. In our hearts, we'll begin to say, is God really with us? Is God really here? Can God really do that? And you'll start to depend upon other means, and you'll start to lean upon other things outside of God. Amen? So we also learned that, um, that um, we have to practice remembering and that we true, to truly worship God, it requires us to do it through spirit and truth. So we're going to continue plowing in this direction, but I want to talk about prayer because prayer enables you to be a worshiper. Prayer activates you and causes you to be ready as a worshiper. Yeah, yeah. Prayer, prayer, when, when prayer is done right, you change. Not only do you change, your circumstances change, your situations change. You become empowered to change other things. When, when, when you're praying the right way, it causes you to encounter truth and the spirit. Now, we're going to learn about the mindsets that goes into prayer. Y'all woke? <laughs> amen. If you're with me, say Amen. We're going to learn about the mindsets that goes into prayer. And one of the mindsets we're going to learn about is Jesus talks about when you pray, pray in this manner. Manner means there is a way to pray. That means that there is a way to pray. There, there is a model, a framework. Because when he taught them, after he said pray in this manner, he wasn't saying just rehearse the words that I say. He's saying take hold of this model, this approach to prayer. If he's pointing and saying there is a way to pray, then that means that there is an opposite direction than the way that he is pointing. So that implies that there's a wrong way to pray. And I know they taught you that, that all prayer is good prayer, but they lied. That's not true. There is a way to pray. And it's not because I'm telling you that. It's because the ultimate authority is saying that there is a way to pray. Jesus, that's who our, our teacher is. And so there's, a, there's a, a wrong way to pray. Wrong prayer doesn't get answered. Wrong prayer doesn't get heard. If you're not careful and you continue in wrong prayer and you continue not to see results from wrong prayer, it will eventually create prayerlessness. Some of us, you know, you know, we humans are creatures. We do things when we feel like doing things. You know, you do things when you feel like doing things. And we feel like doing things once our belief and our focus is, and we're focused on the benefits of doing something. And our imagination begins to focus on what it will be like if we do it. And we think about the results of what we're about to do. And it motivates us to do things. But if you're consistently engaging in prayer and there's no results, there's no answers, there's no change, eventually you'll feel like praying less and less and less, and you won't prioritize it as much as you need to prioritize it. And you'll create a prayerless generation. All because we didn't understand that there is a way to pray. And that without prayer, you can't be a true worshiper. So there's a way to pray. I, I remember there's a great revivalist. How many know Charles Finney? You heard of that name? You got you to study history. You got to study the history. Studying these great revivalists, you'll start to see their, their, what the strengths and what allowed something to be and, and what caused something to fail. And, and do you know great strategists, generals and armies, they study past wars to see what worked well. And, and, and they studied the tactics and strategies. Even great chess players, they, they study past moves and past games and they memorize them. So we as Christians, we need to be astute as to what has happened happened before us. So you, if you don't study revivalists or study moves of God, you should. You got to become a student so you can understand and develop and see what worked and what did not work, right? And so Charles Finney, it was this guy, great revivalist. I remember when he was first becoming a convert um, to Christianity, and he was sitting in the back of the church, and, and, and they were having these prayer meetings. And, and he was coming, and he would watch them pray, they would pray over, and 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 nothing would happen. And I remember that they asked him, do you want us to pray for you? You're coming. You know, brother, what, do you have any prayer requests? And he said, why? Why would I want you to pray for me when everything you pray for doesn't seem to be coming to pass? I come here day after day, but I don't see any change. Why would I want you to pray for me? And he said that it caused him to almost start to question God. I wonder if people are questioning God because they see us praying for the same thing over and over and nothing changes. 
He said he had to, it caused him to go into this place of doubt. And he began going through his Bible and, and seeing. And then he learned that there is a way to pray. And there's a wrong way to pray. There's a such thing as earnest prayer, fervent prayer. Prayer in faith. And so we're going to do some work to really understand how prayer enables us to be worshipers. And what is this way that God was teaching his disciples how to pray? So if you can, turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to start at verse 5. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. And I'm going to be reading out of the King James Version. Yeah, I got to wake up because y'all going to make me sleepy. I'm looking at y'all. <laughs> y'all looking sleepy. Make me sleepy. Amen. Say amen when you got it. Yeah, I got there fast. I'm reading out the King James Version. He says, and when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of man. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them. For your Father knoweth what things ye need of before ye ask him after this manner therefore pray ye our father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen amen ha ah, so jesus starts off by teaching his disciples um there are mindsets needed to approach prayer so before you say anything out of your mouth you have to get your mind right prepared for prayer uh, he starts off by saying when thou prayest thou shalt not be as the hypocrites for they love to pray did you know hypocrites love to pray Hypocrites. A hypocrite is a pretender. It's one who puts on a mask, but yet they're really different behind the scenes. Hypocrites love to pray, he said. I, don't be surprised. The enemy has always disguised himself as an angel of light. Hypocrites, they love to pray. So don't be surprised if you go to a prayer meeting and the people who are always talking about prayer are the least like him. Hypocrites love to pray. He said, don't be like them standing in the synagogues and in the corner of the streets that they may be seen of men but the difference is their motive why they are praying who are they praying for he said they're praying to be seen why are they praying who are they praying for and then he said verily i say unto you they have their reward but thou when thou prayest enter into thy closet and when thou hast shut the door pray to thy father which is in secret and the father who sees in secret shall reward you in public. You got to be care of people who only have a public prayer life. Who only want to pray when other people are around. Because it's what you do in private that empowers you for what you're going to do in public. It's the private thing that gives the public thing power. Uh, uh, the, the disciples, they seen what Jesus was doing in the public, but yet they approached him about what he was doing in the private. They connected the dots and they say, oh, your public must be like this because of what your private is like. It's the private. It starts in private. And he, what he was telling them is your mindset has to be you only have one audience. Your mindset has to be that I'm only... When, I, when I'm in worship, when I'm praying, I, I only have one audience. The people are there, but they're not there. Do you know I can be in a private space in a very public room? I only have one. I, I get into a secret place to where y'all start to disappear. And I only have one audience to where I'm not going to be as concerned about what's happening with you. Now, you got to be careful because with all Christians, all people, sometimes we get tempted, especially when you're pay, praying in public, to where you get more caught up on the amens and the yes lords while you're praying. 
And, and you, you close your eyes and you're praying and then you'll start to pay attention. Are the people with me? Am I by myself? You start to be self-conscious and you get nervous and you be fearful and you start to become a performer. So you got to be careful. He's saying if you want to be seen by the Father and if you want reward in the public, it's about being private. It's about only, so my mind has to be, I only have one audience. I'm only doing this because I want him to see me. I, because if, you're, if it becomes I want them to see me, he says you got your reward already. You don't need nothing from him. So the first mindset is I only have one audience. I only want him to see me. He says, he says but when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Hmm. So the, the second understanding that he was teaching them that you have to have when you're approaching prayer is that a lot of prayer and a lot of talking in prayer does not equate to me being heard. So you can have 15 prayer meetings and still not be heard not one time. It's, not, it's, it's, it's quality over quantity. Vain repetition there's a scripture that says, do nothing from selfish ambition and for vain glory. That includes prayer. Vain has to do with something that's empty. It's lacking life. And, and so Jesus is not against repetition because I remember the parable of, 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 the, of the widow and the unjust judge. How she kept coming to the judge with her petition over and over and over and over. But it's the vain part that Jesus is coming against. Things that are empty. Do you know the most important thing in prayer is not you getting your will across. Prayer is about his will. You can't be an intercessor. I don't know how many intercessors I hear. And the only thing they're praying is about what they want. God, do this. And you have no discernment of what the will of the father is. You can't really push through in prayer until you get understanding of what he wants. Vain repetition. I'm saying these things. This is what the Bible talks about in James when he says, you're asking for things, but you don't get the things you're asking for because you're asking to consume it upon your own lust. It's called praying amiss. I am missing his will. So it doesn't matter how often I say it, how many times we come together or who I get to agree with me. It's not going to be heard. So the mindset has to be, it's not the quantity, it's the quality. I have to focus on the quality. Is there life? Has he directed this? Has he revealed something for me to push through? If not, it could be coming from a place for you to consume it upon your own lust of what you want. So that's the, that's the third mindset. No, that's the second mindset. The, the next mindset we see is, be not like unto them, for your father knoweth what things ye need of before you ask him. Now, this is the third mindset. The God knows what you need before you ask him. Now, I just canceled a lot of people prayer time right there. Because sometimes we only approach God with our list of stuff that we need. Like he doesn't know that we already need. So then you say, well, what is the point of praying if I'm not going to come to just tell God what I need? That's what we finna learn about. Remember, prayer enables you to be a worshiper. Hmm. Remember, I said is this the term vassal that pays homage, the, the vassal that belongs to the king or the Lord. Remember, I brought up that term. And remember, the vassal is not doing it's living for the king or the Lord that he's pledged his life to. And the king or the Lord has the obligation to supply the needs of the vassal. So it's not like, so prayer is not just for you to bring your list of needs. Amen. That's the third mindset that you have to have. The fourth mindset is after, he says, after this manner, therefore pray ye. So the fourth mindset is there is a way to pray. Embrace that. There is a way to pray. The fifth mindset is, is when he starts and he says, our father, which art in heaven. Now, we got up into this point, and we, we're just now starting to talk in prayer. Sometimes we approach prayer too fast. Sometimes we just jump into opening our mouths. 
But we have to deal with our mind and our heart first. This is why it's so good to read your Bible before you pray. It, you have to organize your mind and your heart to be able to approach the throne of God. And this is the, 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 the fifth mindset begins to, to finalize everything. Our Father who art in heaven. To, to say that, you have to think about what happened to make him your father. Because at one time, we were all enemies. At one time, we were not his, not his people. But then Jesus came. He became our peace with the Father. Jesus came. He suffered on our behalf. The father sent his pride and joy. He so loved the world. He so loved me that he did something. This, this baffles me. I want you, that when you read your word, it, it, there's this, this um, passage that talks about how our flesh is like a piece of grass that's here one day and gone the next. Do you know how irrelevant a small little piece of grass in your yard is? Who thinks about that? How frail it is. Even when it's gone, you don't miss it. You don't care. But the Bible says he loved you so much, even though you are like that thing compared to him. Like, remember that mindset of I'm a dog that kisses his master, because when you start to really understand who he is, you can't even compare yourself to. That's why the angel said, what is man that you are mindful of them? He, he loved me that much to where even it was he was in agony. And the Bible says this, it gets me. He says it pleased the father to crush the son. To crush the son. Your son has nails in his hands and, and he's naked and he's been abused and he's been talked about and ridiculed. He's been homeless and he's been spit upon. He's been whipped. He's missing pieces of flesh. And it pleased the father. This father is smiling on his son. All because of you. So approaching prayer and we say, our father, it causes your heart to shift from entitlement and it causes your heart to shift from all of the problems of the world to this position of, oh, he loves me. He has promises for me, plans for me. He'll never leave me or forsake me. He is my father. He has sweet. He said, he said, he said, even to the end of the world, I'll be with you. I'll provide for you. Don't worry about this and that. Your father already knows. He takes care of the birds and he takes care of all of these things that I'll be with you. It prepares your heart. It, that's why the Bible says enter his courts with what? It causes you to start to be thankful. So we spend time there. As my mind is in the right place, my, my mouth, my lips aren't, aren't uttering things that my heart isn't connected to because I've started meditating the right way. So now when I say something, it means something to me. Amen. Our Father. So those are the five mindsets. Um, one, um, what's the first mindset? Anybody got it? Only have one audience. Two, Amen. Three. Four. And five. Our father. My mind has to be, he is my father. Don't approach him like a distant deity. He is my father. That's the relationship that he died. Our spirits cry what? Abba. Father. He's my father. So now let's get into prayer. <laughs> now let's get into it. Do you see all of those things that happened before we get to this? So now he says, our father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So what happens here? This is why, this is why the word of God is so important. The, so how, to hallow means to make holy. It's to separate from what is common and profane. It's to put a distinction between what's, you know what kills us? What kills me is every time I approach God like he's common. Every time we come into this place and, and we get into his presence and we act like he's just something that's just ordinary. Yeah. It, 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 when you approach the, that's why in, in the um, Old Testament, they used to make a difference. They said put a difference between what's holy. When you approach him in that way, you are destroying what you need in order to go before the throne. So, so, so. You read the word and you begin to learn about him. 
I begin to see how with Israel, God, even though they disobeyed you, you still forgave them. You still kept your promise to Abraham. And you begin to see how you brought, oh, God, you brought, you done wonderful things. You brought water out of rocks and, and, and you done wonderful things and how merciful you were to them. And you begin to, you begin to, because to hollow is to acknowledge and render unto. You begin to put a difference and you begin to say these things. You bring your own testimonies and you say, God, yes, you did make a way out of, for, uh, for me when there wasn't a way, God. You did open doors and you did heal me when I was, you begin to hollow his name and what's happening is you're starting to position yourself he is getting magnified and as he gets bigger and bigger and bigger you become more persuaded and more persuaded and you become like that dog that actually sees himself as oh I'm lower than you God look how grand you are the Bible says this all the nations in the world are like a drop of water in a bucket do you know how small that is it disappears that, 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 that it doesn't matter if you are in Africa right now or right here. We're all in the middle of God because he's too large. There is no I went to the edge of God. The, the Bible talks about he is the one who searches the bottomless pit. How does he know it's bomb, bottomless? Because he had to search it. He can do these things. He declares the end from the beginning. You begin to confess these things, acknowledge him, enter his courts with thanksgiving. We did that now. I mean, his gates with thanksgiving. Now we're entering his courts with praise. We hollow him. And what happens is he become less, less common to you. Everything else becomes smaller. He becomes big. Because the dangerous thing is to go into prayer without faith. You don't want to go into prayer in a hopeless position, throwing a pity party. God, my problems, and God this, and why don't you do this, and what is happening, and God, how could you let this be? And then you lost it at that point. To approach prayer, you have to have the faith necessary. The prayer of faith is, 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 is worth much. So we hollow his name. We spend time hollowing his name. This is not just some quick thing and some flattery of the lips. This is where things begin to change. That's why he says he inhabits the praises of his people. When your heart really means this, I want you to understand, think about this. How many of us show, and I get it. I get it. I get it. How many of us show up to church without our mind ever going through a process and our hearts ever being prepared and ready? So when we do come in into collective worship, we find ourselves dry. Now, I get it. Life hits. Life lifes, like they say. Right? The devil is deviling. Flesh is fleshing. I get it. But we have an obligation we, 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 the teacher has taught us what to do in order to keep our mind in the place that we need our mind to be. All right. Hallowed be thy name. Now, thy kingdom come. That, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'll be having to pause because I want you to continue to connect this to worship. That's the expression that comes from the homage that's being paid. Remember our definition of worship? That the, that the, that's the kiss. Hallowed be thy name. I'm expressing because I am in submission and in, in a relationship with you. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come has to do with the government of God coming down. Thy kingdom come has to do with the rulership of God in your life. Like this is all in prayer. The rulership of God in your life. And, and I remember in Israel, the people, um, they would all, every time they had disputes or problems or issues, they would go to Moses. And Moses would have to judge. He would say, you're wrong. You're right. Ah, we're not dealing with this. And it was so much. And Moses got some wisdom from his father-in-law. And he, he took some of his spirit and put it on some other people. And they began to judge. But Moses still had to judge the hard problems. And this was because the people rejected the type of relationship that God wanted to have with them. God wanted to talk to all of them. And they said, no, no, no. That's too much. Let them just talk to Moses. We'll deal with Moses. That, that's your guy. Right. And so but what God wanted was a nation that was ruled from the inside out. 
God wanted a nation that was ruled. Can you imagine not ever have to go to an external court or have to deal with the external king? Because what's ruling inside of me judges me already. And it causes me to change and it causes me to have to, to sort through my problems according to his mind. That's what he intended. Thy kingdom come. So what happens is, this is why you got to read your word, because what happens is you begin to stuff yourself full of good stuff. And the Holy Spirit will come and bring remembrance back to that good stuff you just stuffed inside of you. And it'll start to say, and you'll start to go through life. And you'll bring up things to God. God, did you see what they did to me? God, did you see this? And did you see what happened? What should I do about this, God? You'll say all these type of things, and God, and the Holy Spirit will be like, well, don't let, don't go to sleep in anger. <laughs> don't, 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 I understand you're experiencing evil, but overcome evil with good. Yeah. Yeah. Forgive them. I forgive you. You forgive them. Like the words will start to come and you will start to experience the Holy Spirit dealing with your life. Thy kingdom come. Situations, you'll, start, you'll find the more words you got inside of you and the more time you spend with the Holy Spirit and in prayer, the more you'll find yourself needing to be judged by somebody else because you've allowed him to judge you. Amen. Prayer is also a place to deal with the purposes of God. Thy kingdom come. Now, I hope we have settled in our mind that we were born for a reason, that there is a such thing as potential being inside of us that needs to be unleashed. God had a plan for us, a vision when he made us, that, that, that you are a gift to the world. God seen it for you to come to the earth. Another thing that we should deal with in prayer is purpose. Thy kingdom come also means let me be where I am assigned to be and do what you assigned me to do. Thy kingdom come also means, God, you have given this vision through prayer and you've revealed it to me. So I'm going to pray it through. How much time do we spend praying about purpose? We just <laughs> we just are willy nilly about it. One day it'll happen. This is something that you hold to in prayer. You persevere with in prayer, assignments in prayer. Do you know the apostles, they would pray about where they went. They understand, okay, you're calling me this. You have bestowed this. You put this inside of me. Now I have to give myself in prayer to pray through what you've put in my charge and for direction. And what do I do next? That is thy kingdom come. As God begins to deal with us with our issues and our dilemmas and the things that we are experiencing, it says, in earth as it is, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now, what they say in heaven is this, yes and amen. That's all they say in heaven, yes and amen. So that means when God begins to say, hey, I know sister so-and-so did this to you, but I want you to do this. Whew. How much fight? I'm going to tell you what happens with us. What's happened with me in the past is God will, <laughs> he will, he will bring his holy judgments. And I would find myself wrestling because of what I don't want to do, how I don't want to humble myself. And if I continue to wrestling, wrestling, I'll just go into, oh, God, but you're so good. God, you know, you know. And what happens is the prayer dries. It dries up and it becomes stagnant. You can't move past it because what you're doing is called quenching the spirit. And to worship, truly worship, you need what? Oh, okay. So thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Yes and amen, Father. If that's what you want to do, I'm going to do it in the name of Jesus. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, this is where the prayer kind of switches. To give us this day means for today, now, our daily, daily means what's sufficient for today. Our daily bread. Bread has to do with food, whatever provides nutrients. So it's this idea of I have needs. It's, this is where you begin to change what your hope is set on and what you're going to rely for the fulfillment of your needs. How many of us have needs? Now, Christ, God who is able to supply 
all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. The issue becomes we as a people, I know we're still being changed, but sometimes we rely on other things to fulfill our needs. You're going to have needs. A car needs gas or it's not going to go. And and, and growing up in the world, we learned how to get other things to, to fill our needs. But as a worshiper and someone who is submission to the Lord and the Savior, you have to learn how to change that. You have to learn how to be vulnerable and to bring, God, I need, I don't know how many people go to prayer and they act like they don't need what they need. Or we'll try to go into prayer strong. Because the worst thing you can do to a holy God is go into his throne in your own strength. No, I am nothing, God. I am nothing, God. I need this, Father. So we shift because there's things that I need. Let me hurry up. So there's things that I need. We can stay on this for a while. Okay, let's, let's move forward. Um, and give us our debts as we forgive our debtors. This is, this is important for us as Christians, because as Christians, we are tempted, we are all tempted to become, how can I say, over-righteous. <laughs> we can be tempted to become better than thou, right? Uh, uh, we are tempted to become high and mighty. Mm. We are tempted to become, oh, you did that? How could you ever? Yeah, that, that's us. That's us. And, and so what has to happen is we have to consistently practice confession. In prayer, you need to consistently practice confession. If we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us. If we say we have no sin, then what? We are a... Uh, so that means everybody got something in here to confess. And as you confess these things, it causes your heart to become more merciful, soft, understanding. I always say I think the best Christians are the Christians who had addictions. Like, because I, I, like I think about Mary... And how, how she was washing Jesus' feet. And she didn't care what was happening around her. While the other Pharisee, ah, I got it all together, was sitting up. And he couldn't understand how she can serve in that type of way. And he said, to who lo is loved much, loveth much. As you begin to come to God, not in your own strength, and confess and acknowledge your wrongs, it does something to your heart, and you get to experience the love of God in the way that the Pharisees couldn't experience it. And it will cause you to serve more fervently, but it also causes you to be understanding to people and their problems. You stop being so judgmental. You start being more understanding and compassionate and merciful. You start to understand when somebody say, hey, I fell. Hey, I fell again. Hey, I fell again. Hey, I fell again. Hey, I fell again. And you don't get that mind that says, what's wrong with you? Because that's what happens to us. We un you start to understand it's a process. And you start to think back over your life. Ah, I remember when I lied that time. And then a situation came and I lied again. And a situation came and I lied again. I thought I was supposed to be a super Christian. So you have to spend time in confession and prayer. It opens up your heart. Paul was able to deal with some hard-headed people because of how he was forgiven and loved. You know, Paul was rejected by a lot of people. He was stoned. He was rejected by his people. That They talked about him. They wanted to kill him. But he understood, man, I am a man who's done some bad things. I understand what it means to be hard-headed and stubborn and rebellious, to think that I'm right. So I'm able to be more merciful to somebody who's in that position. Confession. Confession. So forgive me, us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Confession makes it easy to forgive people. It makes it a lot easier. Because every time I forgive somebody, I'm not thinking about them. <laughs> I'm not thinking about them and what they did. I'm thinking about what I did. Huh. When somebody comes to me, and I'm not thinking about do they deserve it or not. I'm thinking about, man, I remember how God forgave me. And it makes it so much easier because I stop calculating their debts, and I start calculating my own debts, and I'll be like, oh, I need this. You know, you can have it too. You know? That's how it starts to be. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hurry up. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That, that's that mindset of saying, God, there's some stuff that I'm not ready for. And as I worship you, and as I follow your Holy Spirit, and as I, as, and as I worship you in truth, I want to be sensitive enough to your Holy Spirit to know when there's some rooms I shouldn't go into because I'm not ready for those rooms. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's about there's some stuff that can still overtake me. The Bible says, if you think that you won't fall. So you, you got to be careful. You got to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. There are some people you can't talk to right now because they will take you over the edge. And you're not ready to talk to them. You need some more love and compassion. There's some rooms where they're doing stuff in those rooms to where it's too tempting for you. So lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. Now they lied to me when I first got saved. They told me that deliverance was for those out there. But deliverance, I found out, was for those in here. <laughs> the children's bread is where deliverance is for. Not the people who don't want to be delivered. It's the people who say, Savior, save me. They said, when you get saved, you don't need to get delivered no more. It's all done. <laughs> no, I found out that you got to be delivered. And so this can happen in your prayer time. I remember I was praying. I was upset. I was frustrated. I was bitter about some stuff. And I'm sitting there. I just got done hollowing the Lord with my piano. And I'm still stuck and frustrated. <laughs> and I start talking to God. And God, through his spirit, began to take me to a place in my memories about where I made an unholy vow because somebody hurt me and how I became revengeful. And he showed me this. I, wasn't, I didn't even think to think about that. And once he showed it to me, I said, Father, forgive me. Who was I to come into a vow as an agreement? An agreement with the demonic. So he had to break the agreement, and I found myself being set free from what was holding me back. Deliverance. So I can be of service to you because you can only serve to the point that you are delivered from. God, help us. You can only serve to the point that you are delivered from. But deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hollowing doesn't stop in the beginning. As you are in prayer... We hollow the Lord all throughout the prayer. The hollowing is like marinating the meat. It's, it surrounds everything. We hollow the Lord. Through this process, we've, we've went through truth, and we are interacting with the spirit, and it should change us. I believe God is so grieved with us as a church worldwide because we're so busy trying to, we're trying to change things without being changed. He's saying, I want to use you. I want you to be a true worshiper. But the first thing that changes is you. You become the light of the world. You, you become a witness. And, and, and I told you what the ecclesia was. The ecclesia is just like, if you can imagine, the, the cabinet members of the one who uh, has the ultimate administration. We go behind closed doors, and he empowers us with his plans. He tells us his secrets. He says, I'm not going to hold back from what I'm going to do. And he reveals these things. So we can be of service to him. But... It happens in prayer. It happens in prayer. We, we got to become prayers again. I know some of us, we've, we've tried prayer, and we don't prioritize it as much, but there is a way to pray. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's stand up. Father, I just want to thank you for what transpired today. God, help. We don't know how to pray. And so we need you. 
We need you completely, God. I'm praying for those who had an ear to hear today. Multiply the seed that was given. Help all of us, Father, to be able to be true worshipers who truly worship you in spirit and truth. Guide us on this prayer journey. As we magnify your name, come into our rooms, our secret places, Father, for you are our audience. We are here for you, Father, and we need you like never before. There are things coming that we can't even imagine. But you said those who know their God shall be strong and they shall do exploits. We are in service to you, Father. We submit. If there is anything that is out of order, begin to correct God. Speak to us about how to posture ourselves before you. Make us a worshiping church. A church that sings songs and really mean what we sing, God. A church that will remember you. A church that will put you first. Huh? The church that will do the exploits of the Lord, God. The church that will see your will fulfilled, God. We will, oh God. Push your purposes into this earth. Mm. Convict us, God. We welcome it. We welcome the conviction of the Lord. We welcome the tenderizing of our hearts, God. Remove the stony hearts, Father, and put flesh. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And we thank you, Lord, today. Amen.